listen for a moment last and hear me tell my tale. How o'er the seas from England shore I was condemned to sail. The jury found me guilty, sir, and said the judge said he. For life, Jim Jones, I sentence you across the storm. Thanks for joining us on Newcastle Family History Society podcasts. The Newcastle Family History Society, located on Awabakal land in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, provides support for those interested in family history. Mel Woodford continues her series about the convict women who were sent to Newcastle and the Hunter Valley. In this episode, Mel recounts the life of Anne Corbett, transported to New South Wales at the age of 22. Her descendants still reside in the Hunter. Many years ago, a grandmother told her grandson about how she was sometimes taken to visit a grave in Old Wall's End Cemetery as a child by her own grandmother. The grave was that of Anne Butt, who died in 1875. Old Wall's End Cemetery is now a park, and the headstones are long gone so nothing marks the place of Anne's burial in October 1875. Her husband, Matthew, died some 16 years later and is also interred there. Children now play above their unmarked graves. Anne arrived in New South Wales aboard the planter in March of 1839 as Anne Corbett, 22, prisoner number 39, Two six six. She had been arrested and tried at Surrey Quarter Sessions on the 9th of July 1838 for larceny, stealing cloth. She was found guilty and sentenced to seven years' transportation across the seas. Anne was born to Thomas and Mary Ann Corbett on the 30th of May and baptised at St Marlebone Church in London on the 27th of July, 1817. Her father's occupation was recorded as artist in the parish register, which tells us that he was a skilled tradesman. Sadly, we know very little of her childhood and adolescence in Bermondsey, the location given on her convict indent and certificate of freedom as her place of birth. What we do know is that she had a prior conviction of six months' duration and that she had an abundance of tattooed letters on various parts of her upper body. These tattoos would be used to identify Anne throughout her life. Anne journeyed to Port Jackson aboard the planter, together with 170 other female convicts, five free women and 14 children, according to the original journal of Thomas Robertson, who was the ship's surgeon. They departed Woolwich, England, on the 10th of November, 1838, their journey taking 119 days, a little over four months. Surgeon Robertson considered all his charges to be in good health when they embarked. Initially, seasickness was a problem but the women soon became accustomed to the motion of the ship. As they approached the Cape of Good Hope, some of the older women were unwell, and the women in general appeared despondent due to the long voyage. Because of this, the ship docked in Simon's Bay to give them an opportunity to recover. This bay near Cape Town was used by the British Navy as a port during the time of transportation. 52 patients were recorded as needing treatment for minor ailments. Anne was not one of them. Every effort appears to have been made to keep the women in good health. Mention is made of the prisoners being kept on deck when the weather permitted. Regular bathing and airing of bedding was also carried out. The areas below deck including the sleeping quarters, were kept scrubbed and well ventilated. The women also attended daily schooling, which taught them how to read and write, as well as participating in dancing and needlework. It is little wonder that no deaths or other casualties were recorded and that the women arrived in good health, 
on the 9th of March 1839. Compared with many other convict voyages to Australia, the women on board this ship were treated with care. On arrival, prisoner number 39266, a young kitchen maid, five foot one and a half inches in height, with a ruddy complexion showing a few freckles and pockmarks, brown hair and dark brown eyes, together with the telltale tattoos, would have been checked and her details recorded. Anne was soon assigned to the area of Brisbane Water near Gosford. It was here that she met Joseph Lee, a Yorkshire man in his early forties, assigned to Robert Henderson at Veteran Hall. Their application to marry in February 1840 was refused, as Joseph had no way to prove that he was indeed a widower. Not long afterwards, Anne met Matthew Butt from Bristol, who was assigned to Willoughby Bean in the same district. Their application to marry was approved on the 7th of May 1841, and they were wed the following month. It was not long until their first child, Mary Ann, arrived. Mary Ann was most likely named after Anne's mother. A second daughter, Phoebe Eliza, arrived in 1843. William was born in 1845 and Joseph in 1847. All the while, Matthew worked as a labourer and sawyer around the Gosford district. Timber was a booming industry, with cedar and forest oak in abundance. By now, both Anne and Matthew had received their certificates of freedom, and they were no longer bound by the system of assigned labour. The Sawyers followed the felling of the trees, living in tents or makeshift huts, away from their families. So Matthew would have been absent for long periods of time, while Anne raised their young family. Life in the 1840s was tough due to a severe economic depression in Australia. By 1852, the family had moved to Min Mai. This was a more heavily populated area as the mining industry grew around Walls End and Plattsburgh. Timber was needed for mine props, so Matthew continued his work as a sawyer. Anne and Matthew saw more than their share of sadness, with the loss of three of their young sons over the next ten years. James, born 1850, died as a toddler in 1852. Baby Matthew was born in 1856, but was drowned when he wandered away to follow the ducks to the pond. The community of Lemon Grove came out to help in the search for the toddler, but nothing could be done when he was found. A coroner's inquest followed. Another son was born in 1861. This child was again called Matthew after his father and the little boy they had lost three years earlier. Sadly, this little one also died within the year. The birth of daughter Carolyn in 1854 was perhaps the only joyous occasion they had to celebrate during these difficult years. Carolyn went on to marry James Richmond at the age of 18 and gave birth to 10 children over the next 20 years, five sons and five daughters. Their first daughter was named Anne Isabella after both her grandmothers. After the death of little Matthew in late 1861, Anne and Matthew had no more children of their own. They were now grandparents, as their first child, Mary Anne, had married William Collins at the age of 16 and soon began her own family living in the same area as her parents. Mary Anne and William Collins went on to have seven children, all of whom survived. Sadly. Anne Butt, knee Corbett, died at an early age of 58 at her home in Plattsburgh. A notice in the paper invited family and friends to follow Anne's coffin from the house 
to Wall's End Cemetery on Sunday the 17th of October, 1875. Her husband, Matthew, lived well into his 70s and was laid to rest in Wall's End Cemetery in August, 1891. Anne kept a family Bible where she entered the names of all her children, lovingly recording their dates of birth and the dates of death for the three little boys who died early. This Bible has been handed down through the family to one of Anne's great-granddaughters through Phoebe Eliza, who married Robert Downey from Kilsyth in Scotland. A young lass from South London travelled to the other side of the world to become the matriarch of a large extended family in the Newcastle area. Many of Anne's descendants still call themselves Novocastrians. Thanks, Mel, for giving us a glimpse of the life of Anne Corbett. Her transition from convict to free settler to mother and grandmother is typical of many of the women who found themselves transported to New South Wales in the 1800s. We look forward to hearing more of the lives of convict women in upcoming episodes. And if you'd like to join us, make sure you follow us on your chosen podcast service. Thanks for listening to Newcastle Family History Society Podcasts. Listen for